it on for the first bit of advertisement that when you are yeah. about this talk, he isn't here. <laughs> it's Saint Jerome, the patron saint of translators. He is the man who translated the Bible from Hebrew into Latin. And this image is very interesting. I, I wanted to do my puja before starting. Anyway, the image shows him writing with a quill and behind him is a skull. And the skull is there because this man, even as a young man, would regularly visit the Roman catacombs because he wanted to remind himself that he was mortal. But because he was engaged in translating the Bible, he knew he was going to be immortal. So it is that kind of man that many of us aspire to be you because we translate the best literature that is available in our language into another language that reaches out to the world. I'm speaking myself because I translate into English and supposedly that takes the work across the world. Um, unfortunately, we went to a translation seminar and there were about 12 translators and there were four publishers and the translators were all gung-ho about what they were doing and the publishers sat with very glum faces saying translations don't sell you know. So, um, there's very little chance of immortality for us. The point is that then, if we are not going to be immortal, why are we doing this? Is there some fame? No, there isn't. Because if your name appears on a translation at all, it appears in an inside page, in a very small font. Is it for money? No, certainly not. No publisher is lining up outside our doors to say, please, we are just waiting for you to translate this, that, or the other, and here's the advance. No. No such thing happens. We have a small percentage of the very small royalty that goes to the original water for our trouble. So, no faith, no money, no immortality. Why do we do it? A lot of us, when we are sitting together and talking about our uh, finally say we are mad. We are mad. It, it, it's a kind of madness that you don't realize that you're getting into when you do your first translation. Your first translation comes to you because a friend wants you to translate her or his supposedly great work. And you do it to a black joke because you love it. And then slowly word gets around and you begin to feel that you've opened a shop. Lots of people come. Lots of people uh, 
people think they read their brain books and come and say, you know, uh, here's my book and why don't you translate it? It's, it's like, why don't you translate it? And uh, it's very awkward for the translator to say that because there is no fame, because there is no money, and because there is no immortality, we are free people. We only translate what amuses us, what interests us, what excites us. So for me, translation has always been either for friends, and then it doesn't matter if they written real tosh, doesn't matter, the friends, or it has been to please myself. And uh, one or two, I think, of uh, the translations which I have done have been purely as a linguistic challenge, just entirely for myself. Give Patel is sitting here, and both have to do with him. He and Tony wanted for the longest time to know what a certain thing called Begum Barbe was all about. They heard a lot about it and they just simply needed to know. And if friends need to know what a thing is about, then we translate it, obviously. But more than a friendly gesture, it was because the play had challenged. Often I had gone through it and thought, how can this be translated? It is in many ways one of the toughest things that I have done. And having done it, I took it across. Gita and Tony were sitting there, read it to them. And they said, we think it works. So at that point of time, there was absolutely no chance that this was going to be published. It was done entirely as a challenge. Later on, the fact that it was, was published was just incidental. The other translation to do with me is his own play, Mr. Bella, which I have admired ever since I have seen it and read it. Uh, and once again, it was a linguistic challenge. I simply had to do it. And this is a problem which I have. If I have some free time uh, when I might put up my feet, might read all those books that I've been waiting to read, or just go out and see a film for the heck of it, not to write about it. There's all that time, and what do I do? I pick up a translation challenge and I get down to it. So similarly, Mr. Bella was there. Time was there. So the both came together and I started translating. And as I said, the challenge was it's it's one thing to translate from Marathi into English when no Marathi is what you could call more or less standard Marathi. And you're translating into more or less standard English. In the case of Mr. Betta, it's a beautifully constructed language. He has kept away from what people would normally do who are writing about Parsi. In English, they will put in words which suggest that this is a Parsi voice speaking. Uh, maybe a little uh, line here, a few words there. Grief has written language that can only be called classical. Classical 
in its rhythms, but also completely a language that one hasn't heard actually spoken. Now the challenge for me was to translate it into a Marathi that was also constructed. It could not be the normal standard Marathi that is spoken. It had to be something that was Marathi but wasn't Marathi. Now that was a clearly creative challenge and those days when I was translating this play, I would like to say were some of the most exciting. I have not been so excited when I've written my own work as I was doing these translations. And finally, the test, of course, was when such a play is actually put on the stage. Because when you translate plays, you are facing all the usual difficulties of translation, which I will soon come to. But you are rendering a spoken word. And a spoken word has to be chosen even more carefully than the written word. So to hear your translation actually be in stage, to hear that language as a, a theatrical language is your final test. And during the first show that we had in Pune, and you know, I don't think you know what Pune audience is. <laughs> Maybe not. But it, it's like you're sitting like this, you know, and just waiting for the first comments to come. And sure enough, they come. In the interval, two people came and said, the first five minutes, we thought, what kind of Marathi is this? This is a Marathi. What kind of translation is this? And then, luckily, within five minutes of the beginning, people can't get up and go. So they were caught. They had to sit through. And by the interval, they said, it was Marathi. Different, but Marathi. And the way the actors were speaking it, uh, was made it quite clear that it was coming trippingly off their tongues. So much happiness in the heart. These are extreme challenges. But the, the, the real challenge, even in uh, linguistically non-challenging texts, is the choices that one is making. Every single word, every single phrase is a choice. It is not something that just flows out of your pen. You are taking as much trouble over the translation as the original writer has taken over the original creation. And the problem, of course, arises with the fact that you have to understand that person's aesthetics. What is guiding the style of the original? What is guiding the choice of words of the original? What is guiding the syntax, the way that the original <coughs> author forms sentences? If sentences are short, they're deliberately so. It's not that the writer can't write long sentences. But short sentences are creating the effect that the writer wants. Now, as a translator, the question that you ask yourself 
right at the start, before you seriously think of translating it, is both aesthetics and ethics. Both come into play. The aesthetic question is, do you understand what the author is trying to do creatively? Do you understand how he is crafting his play or his novel or the short story? Unless you understand the craft behind that creative effort, you are not going to understand how to render this in the best and the most faithful way possible. The ethics is what ultimately are you trying to do? Are you trying to create a text that is going to flow smoothly, that the reader is going to say, oh, this sounds like English. You know, it's as if the original was written in English. I'm not sure I take that as a compliment because what I want to do is to bring the author's voice even into the translation. If the author has written a passage that sounds to me like a rough passage, I have to give the author the credit to believe that she or he meant it to be rough. And if they meant it to be rough, then it is my responsibility, I'm obliged to try and create the same kind of rough texture in my translation. So smoothness as a, 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 the ultimate value doesn't exist for a translator who has chosen, I'm saying chosen, to be completely faithful in aesthetically, in word and spirit with the original. But there is another kind of translation, which is generally translation of poetry. With poetry, the challenges are completely different. And one of the reasons why I don't translate poetry, if I can help it, is because I do not want to take the responsibility for recreating the original. You cannot but recreate the original because sometimes, for instance, it's a right word. What do you mean? If, if, if you try and do a, a rhyming translation, it's possible that you will sound completely banal because rhymes that come naturally in one language don't come naturally in the target language. So by and large, I have kept poetry aside. It's only under duress that I translate poetry. There are problems enough in prose translation. For instance, Dialect. Dialect is extremely difficult to translate. Slang, very difficult to translate. Um, curse words, very difficult to translate. Because each of these comes with any word for that matter, comes with its cultural association. You can't remove the word from this context and put it into another language. So uh, you, there are people who make choices when they know who their readership is going to be. So if someone is translating for an American read, uh, reader, then automatically the, the 
idioms that they use, the slang that they use, are things that the uh, American reader is familiar with. But it, it makes very little sense to people who know both the original and the translated version. Uh, one example that has stuck in my head is a translation of another extremely difficult play by the same playwright who did Begum Barbe. This is Satish Harikar, whose first um, play was called Mahanirvan. And in Mahanirvan, there is um, a line in which uh, the word Langot is used. Now, Langot is Langot. It simply can't be anything else. I don't think anyone else in the world wears Langot. So there's no equivalent word for it. The translator of this play called them Jockey Shops. <laughs> now, Anyone who's seen a Langot <laughs> and sees jockey shots beside it is completely unconvinced and shocked. But uh, the, the, these are the problems with keeping a certain leadership in mind. You can't do that because supposedly English is going all over the world, including most of all within India where most people have lost their first language and only know and communicate in English. And that English is of a very peculiar kind. And it's an English in which you can gusaw someone. <laughs> so you're, if you are aiming only for the Indian reader, then your translation would be perhaps much easier. But uh, in your head, you have the idea, the English are reading it, the Americans are reading it, the Australians are reading it. So there's no chance to give Kusau anything at all. The, the, the problem, as I said, with uh, dialect words or idioms or sayings, and right now, all this is right at the top of my head because I'm struggling very hard with an uh, autobiography that was published in 1934. And it is by a woman whose husband uh, converted to Christianity. She is a third Brahmin who believes in all the Brahmin her pujas, her customs, her rituals, everything. And husband uh, converts. And for five years, uh, she and he live apart. She is guarded uh, by her family who think, leave her and she'll run off and become a Christian herself. So this, it, it's, it's a fascinating story, but belonging to 1930, there are a whole lot of words there which uh, give me sleepless nights. I mean, clearly sleepless nights. I might get up at 12 in the middle of the night and think, oh God, I haven't found a word for that yet. So, uh, and the second thing with this uh, text is that it is humorous. It is so funny. She is full of self-mockery. And all of that is embedded in the kinds of words that she uses. And my job is to find equivalence for it in English. Uh, there's one word which I'm struggling with. This woman has a stomach problem, chronic stomach problem. It suddenly crops up. 
and then she is laid flat. No way that she can do anything at all while it lasts. Now, she describes her condition as doing Loran Pugari. Loran Pugari. Now, Loran Pugari actually is a, a kind of game that young girls play and some older women also try to play. Is uh, you catch hold of your big toes. So you become a kind of bunny. And in that position, you tumble around. That's the game. It's a very difficult game to play. Uh, and what actually uh, it means is you're doubled up in play. But if, you, if I say, and so there I was, doubled up in pain. Is there any humor in that? So where is that self identity? How can I get that? You know, if you're very strict with yourself, which a lot of translators are not, if you're very strict, then you give yourself sleepless nights. It happened to me when I was translating Jerry Pinto's M and the Big Home. How do I translate the title itself? M is fine. Big Home? What do I do with that? So, I would go to bed with this going on in my head. I would get up in the morning and leave those cross, cross, cross there which I always do when I can't instantly think of the equivalent and carry on. And then suddenly, one night, I got up and said, of course, he is a boomerang. Who else can he be? So the book became M. Ani Boomerang. And it fitted so perfectly. But uh, lots of words in that book. And I, I would say that it's one book which has uh, given me uh, uh, more severe headaches than anything else that I've done. Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, it's an entire uh, Catholic context. Now, to transfer that context into Marathi is extremely difficult. Then, M is an Anglophile. She keeps quoting from English literary sources. She keeps remembering old English rhymes. How do I get that into Marathi? There was one uh, place where, uh, through association, she's, I think she's talking about ambulances and then by association she goes to ambivalence and from ambivalence she thinks of a rhyme. Now, I wasn't just being called upon to think of a word for ambivalence or for ambulance. I had to get this entire thing. <coughs> and then I was completely blank. But nights are good, always good. So again, one fine night, I thought of a song which had to do with this kind of swaying, this kind of ambivalence. It was Dolkar or Dolkar. <laughs> Famous song which even non marathi people know. Uh, that's right. So, with that, then, uh, actually, because it's a song to be sung on about a boat, the rocking and rolling of the boat became the ring. So, that, that's called a dolkaki. So, that became the link to the song, problem solved. 
But after what effort? After how much pain? So uh, uh, this, this, as I said, presently it's Loran movie, and it is also a proverb. Proverbs are practically impossible. There's a proverb in Marathi um, uh, which goes, "Aga amanshi mala Now you have to understand what situation this is used. This is used in a situation where you want to go somewhere or you want to do a particular thing, but you don't want to imagine that you want to do it. So you are putting the blame on something else that is supposedly leading you to what you want. So the mice, the buffalo, is leading you to what you want. But you are saying, where are you taking? Now, how, how do I get this between it? First of all, to get buffaloes into an English novel is one problem. And the other, where, where do humans uh, and buffaloes live together in such close proximity that the buffalo is leading the human being? Then, of course, one takes um, the root that all translators use, which is not to address the difficult phase directly, but to go around to suggest, sometimes magically, to find something in English which is which approximate the meaning of the original. You use all kinds of ploys to be able to suggest what the original author is doing. Now, I'm often asked, why do you translate <coughs> things that have already been translated? There are, at this moment, six translations of Anna Karenin, all in existence together. Six, one novel, but if you take just the first famous line of the novel, all happy families are a daddy. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own. So, You'd be amazed that there are six versions of this. And each translator feels that he or she has got it right. One translator who is uh, hyper faithful to the original has rendered it as all happy families resemble each other. That's exactly what Tolstoy has written. The others have opted for an aphoristic rendering. It's got a beautiful balance. All happy families are a crime. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own. So it makes a very rhythmic sentence. And the translator feels tempted to do that kind of thing. And if it's not actually taking you away from what the writer means, it's okay to do that. I mean, it's okay for me to do that. I have done it without feeling guilty about being unfair. Now, what I'm going to do is talk about versions of translations. It seems to a lot of people who uh, wonder about, there are very few people who wonder about translation actually. Translations are just taken for granted. And there are a couple of translators who have gone on record saying 
Who do you think you're reading? You think you're reading Tolstoy? No, you're reading me. Those are my words. But uh, I like to take the subdued part. Who am I? No copy. I'm just a little bridge, you know, between this and that. And I, I, I like, personally, I like that very much. It's, it's like uh, being an actor. You're, you, you are performing another person's language. And as far as possible, you're not acting. Unless it's a comedy where you're expected to act. You're not adding. So the translator does not add it as far as possible. So I have got here. Uh, Shanta, can I yes. one second? Can we move a little ahead? There are a lot of people standing in the house. And if I can be of the movie, can I? There's a short story by a Dalit writer called Babu Rao Babu. He was the first Dalit uh, to uh, break through the uh, middle class, upper caste literary work uh, with his story. And of course, his uh, entire approach to language is completely different from the standard. Now, this story is about, um, as the title suggests, woman of the street. She is a sex worker and um, she hears that her son is ill and she wants to earn enough money to go back to the village and be with her son. So, originally, yeah, this is how it goes. I'll, I'll read it though you don't understand Marathi, I'm reading it for, uh, to give you an idea of the rhythms of this. So, uh, she, she has just prayed to all the gods and she has asked uh, ask them to bless her so her business that evening will prosper and at the same time her rival's business will be good and she is absolutely certain that uh, God is going to answer her wish because she has uh, fed poor people, she has given things chakra to some, someone, etc. So she is that morning extremely confident and she has gone to her favorite, uh, I call it hotel. That is a problematic word. A hotel in Marathi or in Indian language, if you say hotel, you see a fairly CV joint with an oily counter and flies sitting on little cakes and stuff like that. And uh, you know that fat man behind the counter. <laughs> that in picture comes to you in its totality. What do you call that in English? Eatery. What kind of picture does that create? So, see, every step of the way the translator is saying, Darling, you're doing your best. You can't do any more than that. So the word I've used is an unfortunate word. It's restaurant. So this woman goes to her usual restaurant and she is full of this joie de vivre. She's got prasad which she is distributing 
to everybody. And here she comes and says to the owner, come and get your guitar. Uh, uh, so, Kasam, uh, Basad, now the language, as I said, is, is a rough language. It, um, it's a combination of Marathi, Hindi, the kind of language that a hotel Mali would use. No way that this can be rendered into English. Because where is the mix? What would you do? So it has to be a, not a standard English, but something used. So she says, Kasam, uh, Pasartha. Then he is bumped. He's, uh, he says, Tichi dharpar ahun malkala bhaga tha. Ani to urdu manala. Tujhi tara ni. He aikas ti dharkan kuchi maage ka... Sorry. Dharkan kuchi maage saadu kore ni tara. Hotel wala ne shanta pani. Tila tara marathi sangam sang. Ti aikun. He named Bongto. And he had a hotel while he had a fire for her. He towered to Gamita and a cheap face him up. He said, He just shook the cane. He was a tavich and it now would have to manage. He required me many, though he didn't summary. He cleaned that big tackle in a और दूसरी बात तेरे जैसे औरत को मैंने पत्ता दिया बहुत उधार दिया बहुत उधार दिया जाओ इतनी मेहरबानी काफी हो गई सो नाउ दिस इज द पैराग्राफ टू बी ट्रांसलेटेड देयर आर टू वर्जन्स ऑफ द स्टोरी एंड आई एम गोइंग टू रीड आउट बुक एंड एस in food programs, that is team number one and team number two, and you have to blind judge which is the winner, and then I'll tell you who that winner is. So, at those words, she shot up. Her chair fell black backwards with a thud. She shouted, Telegram, the restaurant owner calmly explained the telegram to her in Marathi. She heard him out and set up a howl. She fell at his feet, begged him to lend her money to go to the village. Not the least moved by her pain and grief. He said, I kept your telegram for two days. Didn't junk it. Didn't throw it with the waste. One more day. I gave a woman like you and address, gave you a lot of credit, a lot of credit. Now, oh, enough of favors. That's one question. When she heard this, she shoved her head at her, sorry, she shoved her chair back with a bang and shouted, Telegram? The restaurant owner calmly explained the telegram to her in Marathi. She heard him and howled. She fell at his feet instantly, begging him to lend her money to go to the village. Not in the least bit moved by her piteous pleading, he said, I kept your telegram for two days. I didn't throw it with the waste paper. Another thing, I gave a woman like you an address. I've given you a lot of credit. A lot of credit. Go now. I've done enough for you. Now, both these translations actually are pretty faithful translations of the original. Now, would you like to grade the two things, please? No, I'm being very mean to you. I'll grade them. The first one, team number one is me. 
flat. <laughs> the second one is an unknown translator, and uh, according to me, being team number one, I feel that uh, uh, she hasn't got that kind of There's a range there in the, in the owner. Somehow, her entity hasn't caught that range. But there is also a compassion. So, uh, now, in the original, it's za, jao, which is rather more brutal. Both of us have chosen to soften it with now, now go. I think it's something that operates in you and instinctively you uh, give it this kind of a, uh, a feeling. Go has no feeling at all. Get out would have feeling, but get out is too brutal for a person like him to you. So now go is the choice that both of us have made. But uh, I have used those shorter sentences. She got up, she did this, she did that. Because there's a kind of, I feel, a, a, a kind of a, a movement that is his life. And also the rush of wanting to do this, which doesn't come through in the slightly longer sense. So, uh, you know, the choices we make in translation are often not so much to do with the actual meaning of words or phrases, because the meaning is there in both. It has also to do with uh, how your response to those characters, how your response to that situation is. And that is what constantly informs what you are translating. Similar, there are translators who uh, do not really have command over the two languages, which you have to have. You have to understand the culture of the original. Because it's not just the words that you are translating as lots of translators have famously said, you're not translating words, you're translating words. So the, uh, the, uh, the responsibility, uh, the cultural associations of one into another is an even greater responsibility than just dealing with words. Now, uh, that's fine. So maybe there's a translator who knows the original language and culture well. But it's equally important that she knows the target language and the target culture well. For instance, uh, going the other way, if uh, you have the English phrase, stiff upper lip, how do you do that in Marathi? <coughs> You don't do that in Marathi because we don't have stiff upper lips. We are emotional people and we will cry, we will laugh, and we do all the loud things possible. So, obviously, we don't have a place for stiff upper lip. Translator would have to find a way around that. In Marathi, uh, there aren't so many shades of laughter. In English, you start from a guffaw, chuckle, grin, smile, a whole lot of shades. In Marathi, laughter is hasna, hasya. That's laughter. Anything further that you want to say, comes with an adjective. And uh, 
I have found that there are fewer adjectives for laughing with. There are more for laughing at. This again is a cultural thing because we do laugh at a lot more than we laugh with. So these are cultural problems that you keep facing. Now here, uh, this is a chronicle of 1857, written by a Brahmin priest who went traveling in the north. He went originally because uh, there was going to be a big yajna uh, by uh, a royal person. And here was a chance to earn a little bit of money. So this priest travels. His name is Vishnu Das Bose. And it is the first eyewitness chronicle written about the 1857 uprising. Uh, he didn't consciously write about it. These are just his memories. And uh, because he reported back these were the things I saw, these were the things we did. Uh, his patron in his village said, you have to write all this down, which he did. And the book uh, was published uh, about 40, 50 years ago. And there were suddenly three translations of the same book. Now, I will read just short passages from two of the three translations and it is of the same um, little pack. Around 10 o'clock, I suddenly developed an itch all over the body. There was burning from head to toe and the terrible itch could not be controlled. The city was about a mile away from there. At last, we stopped under a tree and I took off the clothes to scratch the whole body. The whole body was full of red, thick, naughty eruptions. All of a sudden, my whole body began to itch. A fire raged from head to the itch was so bad, I was helpless. The nearest town was a mile away. So I stood under the tree, took off my clothes and scratched. That brought out dense red hides all over my heart. You will guess that second is team number one. <laughs> Otherwise, why would I read this out to you? Now, problem, as I said, in not knowing the second language, the target language, with, is that the word in Marathi that is used for these eruptions actually means height. Now, if you don't know that word, then you're calling it what? Naughty, red, thick, naughty eruption. And that's a very, very awkward rendering. It doesn't really uh, give you a picture of actually what has happened. And the final example I'm going to give is from my own mom, which gave me almost as much of a headache as doing James. Because uh, when I, anybody writes in a particular language, they're not, they're addressing a known readership. I know who I'm addressing when I'm writing in Marathi. I know what phrases I can use to be completely understood. Now, I 
without, of course, thinking into the future and thinking, oh my God, I might one day have to translate this. I have uh, decided here to talk about language itself. Now that's the worst thing that uh, uh, that can happen to a translator. I I, I will have to read this for you to understand. There is this artist and he has just made a statement that uh, all colors for him have a taste and a sound. To look at a color suggests a sound and also suggests a taste. And taking off from there, this is what he is saying to his, to this young woman whom he is wooing without showing that he is wooing her. She knows he is being, she is being wooing. So, um, this is what he is saying. Kara ha rang, kara ha rang hi aake, ani shabd hi aake. Ya rangala, ingraji black mandala. Black mandala ki mala kinchit karkasha avazio yeto, ani jibhevar ambar chau yeto. Par kara mandala ki kana Pani Kharkhalas Rukhavata Ani Jibhevar Piklela Zambharachi Gor Pular Zavitre Teka Black Zavitre Kari Bandha Kheliyas Rukha Nirvani Zavitre Kaya Zavitre Mukhle Padhani Kyaacha Shivti Akar Ake Manu कायात अंकिन एक प्रभावित अक्षर है ल ल से दोन गोलाकार मासन पहले आप उन दूसरे दूसरे आप उन पहले आप गिरवत बसला तो ल कभी सपना दस नहीं now ल if I knew I was going to translate this would I have talked about ल for the how I supposed to do this? So um, I had to be finally very technical. How would an uh, English reader understand flow? Linguistically, it is called retro retroflexive L. How would an English reader understand that either? <laughs> but I had absolutely no choice. My only option was to drop this entire discussion. But it is so closely related to the work that the artist is doing that I couldn't drop it either. So uh, these six lines became Ten lines because I was trying to reach out to that unknown reader. Listen, this is what I mean. <laughs> so here goes. Yeah. When I hear the English word black, I hear a faintly screechy sound with a sour taste. When I hear the Marathi word kara, with the retroflex L. <laughs> I, I hear about bubbling water and imagine the taste of a fully ripe, sweet, tart zambul fruit. Now, I don't have to, if I, I just say zambul and everyone knows what it is, but here I have to explain. It's the sound of words, otherwise black and color mean the same thing. To me, black sounds like the shooting of a bolt, a final sound, because of the way the A is pronounced. All this is addition, huh? Because of the way the 
A is pronounced. It's not the laid back A of father. It is um, uh, the sharp A of fat or that. It's the uh, it, it's yeah, it's followed by the consonant cluster CK, which forces you to cut your breath and stop sound black. End. Now take Kaya. Apart from the soft retroflex L, it ends with an open power that allows you to extend your breath. Even the shape of the letter suggests continuity. Two plump circles. If you trace them from one to the other and back, you need never stop. So, there I am as translator. Have I said enough? <laughs> Questions at all, please, ma'am. Instead of using the word Jambul, why not Blackberry? Because Jambul is in Blackberry. Simple. But to the point, please let me give creates another picture, which is not the picture of Rahul. And it doesn't have the taste of Rahul. Here, I'm talking about the taste as well. But uh, are you uh, thinking that uh, the English man will be aware of the word Jambul? Not at all. That's why I've said sour or whatever taste. I've sort of fed him with a lot of information. So he does finally get <coughs> that there is some smoke like this in India. India. Yes. Yeah. I want to say that as a translator, uh, you are creating and writing a lot of your own words. It's not transliteration from one word to the other. So doesn't the translator become like a co-author with the author and then say translated into so and so? Because there's so much of you, like you say, linguistically, uh, from a region, from a country, all this emotion, so much of it you recreate. It's yeah. as good as rewriting the entire book. Yeah. I'll tell my publisher. <laughs> 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 it doesn't come easy. Like when you hear about it, it's completely like rewriting. Yeah. Well, I mean, I there are translators who try to believe that. <laughs> but isn't but that I'm, I'm very submissive. I, uh, uh, I, I don't mind the second place. It's okay. <laughs> the, uh, the process itself is so rewarding. That's different. That's different. That's different. Yeah. But no, but true. Yes. I understand. Yes. What As the intent says, recreating an entire yeah. yes. of yes. another author. Yes. And so yeah. much of it is you that you have created. A yes. That's true. It's just like a translator becomes a little secondary sort of thing. One is happy, that's different. I just feel like a co-author with English or yes. Russian or whatever language. Sure. That's right. How do we do that? Because I know you and I just admire you like anything. <laughs> Have you ever had faced, uh, I mean, had to translate when, you know, the writer herself has translated in her mind and written in English, but then she wants it, you know, translated into another language. So she's, her text is full of, uh, her own uh, language words, which she hasn't, you know, and then she puts a parenthesis and explains them in English. Have you ever faced that situation? You know, she's a, I read, read a book recently where she's aiming at the American audience, which is writing set in India. So whenever she uses words that she cannot translate, she's written in English, but she used the Indian word with the meaning in English. How? And how? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's a, uh, a problem that, uh, a translator has to sort out with the publisher. Publisher has certain ideas about this. A lot of publishers feel that in today's day, um, where languages uh, are supposedly crossing borders, it's okay to use the original word without quotes uh, or without italics. Uh, some publishers feel that you use the word and also provide a footnote. But uh, uh, the first kind of 
publisher of, of Footnote makes it look like an academic book. And it puts readers off. Can I put a break on the flow of the That's right. That's right. So, uh, you know, like lots of us, for instance, read Russian novels um, translated by the great Constance Garnet. And who knew what a samovar was? I had no idea. I just thought some kind of pot out of which they are drinking tea all the time. Didn't matter really. But when I actually saw the image of a samovar, it made a lot of sense. It added that grace and beauty. It was not just a pot. It was this very beautiful utensil. But not knowing it didn't stop me from uh, uh, appreciating the translation itself. Yeah. Someone had a hand. Yeah. yeah. This, you being a woman translator, influence uh, the text that you're translating in any format? Uh, it, uh, I think it does. I think it does. but. I have no evidence to prove that. Because uh, as an exercise, if um, I sat a male translator down, uh, got him to translate a piece, which then I also translated. And then we compared it to be a laboratory experiment. And then next time round, I say to him, yes, there is a difference. But at this moment, I don't. Yeah. Do you think humorous writing, translating is more challenging than just the narration of a novel? Absolutely. Absolutely. Long years ago, someone suggested that I translate Pula Dei yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> yes. I did one piece which was the easiest where the uh, uh, child friends go out on a trip and the gravy falls on the goatee and burns the thigh. But, I mean, it, 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 I just couldn't get a humor through. So, yes, it is uh, more difficult. Yeah, but it also depends on the kind of humor. There are some kind, for instance, I would never dare even to translate one para of P.G. Woodhouse in Marathi. <laughs> Out of the question. But there was a Syrian made in Hindi. Which? This was uh, in the uh, uh, 80s. Leave it to Smith. Huh. Was, uh, in Hindi? In Hindi. On, what did they do with uh, Lord Ellsworth? <laughs> I don't know. On the production it used to come. Really? It was fun in its own way. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So it must have been an adaptation. That's the other thing. There are three words in news. There's translation, there's adaptation, there's recreation, and there's, there's a fourth word. Yes, <laughs> Yes, let's not be so <laughs> But there's also inspired by. How do you distinguish between literal translation and free translation? Um, I think uh, those categories fall into these three categories. Uh, literal translation, uh, I think we'll invent a fourth category. Let's call it bad translation. <laughs> literal translation is bad translation. Uh, because if you take the word literal, literally, what it means is you're going, ah, this word, this word, this word, this word. That's all. Uh, but I've had a long discussion with uh, a, 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 a woman translator who lives in their Kolkata. She's so stubborn. No, <laughs> but she's Kolkata. <laughs> So, she said, uh, you know, uh, 
there is something called academic trouble. So I said, uh, what might that be? Um, so she said, well, academic translation is a translation that gives the reader an exact idea of what the original author said. I said, what do you think he tried? <laughs> so, but I have read an academic translation after that. And the penny dropped. I said, ah, this is academic <laughs> Because this translation uh, was of a 200-page book and became a 400-page book. Because every single concept was translated and explained within the text. So, obviously, uh, an academic translator isn't translating for you and me and other people. It's translating for those people who are going to look at the whole thing academically, whatever that means. So, but at least I actually I was very scared of your notebook. <laughs> I saw her taking out her notebook and pencil and thought, my God. <laughs> because there's a brilliant story which I applied to myself as translator, which is uh, between theory and practice, uh, where the centipede is asked, how do you walk? And the centipede is totally immobilized. <laughs> so, so I thought, I'm not going to give her anything for her notebook, because <laughs> I'll just have to shut up. Yes. Ma'am, we understand like uh, it's not just about word to word conversion, which is translation. Like, you use translate the whole word, which means that the message, the sense, the mood, everything basically comes together, and then you take maybe some liberties since there could be limitations. But now, as a translator, if you someone gives you a piece of work which has to be translated, maybe you have not read it before, but let's say it's very deep and very intense, and maybe the kind of word work which. You don't really understand fully in a first go, maybe you have to read multiple times to really understand all the layers of it and the messaging and the subtle things about it. So if something like this is given to a translator, what is a translator's journey when they look at it and they want to do justice, they are going to understand and not still miss it, but they have limitations. So how does that thing work? See, what, uh, what your question does is to make a category called translator. I am me. What I do, another translator may not. So each one of us has a way of approaching any text given. There are translators who will read a text like this and really not react to all its denseness, all its complications, because uh, they can whistle through it that a translator should just make it. Uh, but ultimately, the question is, do you want to do that translation? Does it speak to you? You choose to translate. I don't translate as an assignment, ever. People have asked me to translate, and I have looked through part of the text, and I have felt that I don't feel so I haven't. That, that's what I meant. That not having fame and money gives us the freedom to choose what to translate. So uh, maybe a text like this would interest me. Because uh, complex things do interest me. So I might go into it and I might go. Uh, I have to decide whether it's worth my time or not. But. Uh, Translators are not one type. Yes. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you have uh, mentioned that uh, translators are like actors. So, anytime it has happened that uh, you wanted to go into that uh, environment 
and you actually took a trip to some place just to understand what the environment was and uh, it, uh, it, I have not needed to go to so far so far I have translated texts whose context and culture I understand that I know at first hand. Uh, but uh, I think ideally, if you didn't have that confidence, then what you're suggesting should be done. Should be. Yeah. Because Vijay Mehta, for instance, knew nothing about uh, the Vidarbha area. And Mahesh Kujra wrote Vada Chire Mandir, which was absolutely rooted there. Vijayamekta made that trip. She stayed there. She got the feel of this place. And then she directed the thing. So in that sense, a translator also would have to do something. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Take your seat. Yes. Are there instances of when the translations became more beautiful and considered better than the original? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I have to be modest and realistic. No, because uh, see, if if you if you want to beautify a text. And you consciously beautify, you just ah, translate, ah, ah, and then it comes up in such a way that right, people right. who know both the languages, yes, who thought yes. the original was very good, great, yeah, yeah. then after reading the translation, this is better. Um, are there instances of that? Uh, I'm, I'm sure they are out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, yes, they, they can. They can. They are. Clearly, they can. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Has there ever been a race against time for you? I don't enter it. No. <laughs> Never. Because, it yes. Gets stuck the words. Yeah. No, no. That is precisely why translation is one thing for which I accept no deadlines. The uh, publisher has to trust the fact that I work my whatever off every single day from morning to evening. And at the end of it, I didn't trust him. So if he is prepared to trust me, I go ahead otherwise. Because also the word business is one thing, but my practice uh, also requires more time because I will translate uh, while looking at the original. That's the first draft. Then I will put the original aside and look through my translation to see if it's making sense in English. And then I uh, go back to the text to make sure that in making it readable in English, have I departed from it? And again, I'd like to bring gift in. It just suddenly strikes me how important he's been in my life as a translator. In this house, we had the most enlightening workshop when A.K. Ramanujan was present. And I'll never forget that. And he, uh, this was again uh, translating Vada uh, Chiripan into English. And uh, I was the Marathi Nomic person. There was Cyrus Mystery. There was Gif and Tomi and uh, Ramanujan, who knew no matter, and uh, Mahesh himself. Uh, and we kept struggling with these uh, complex lines. And because there were four people, there were always four translations, always four versions. And then, of course, there were uh, quarrels, and not this, not this, and so on and so forth. Throughout this, Ramanuja would sit back with his eyes closed, like this. At the end, he would say, now, can someone read out the original? So someone would read out the Marathi. And what was the first translation? So someone would read. 
What's wrong with that? <laughs> that you see, <laughs> that sometimes you work yourself into a froth for no reason. The first thing that you did is the best thing, quite often. But you have to test all this out. And for me, it takes a lot of time. We were just talking about the team A and team B. I just wanted to pick up on that one. Um, how does an author choose his translator? And how often is it that the author chooses a first-time translator? Uh, I don't think that uh, a first-time translator gets chosen. It's the other way person who wants to translate, who's excited by work and would like to do it, translates without telling anybody, translates on the slab almost, because finally she's not sure how it's going to turn out, so best to keep quiet. At the end of it, if she feels confident enough, she will then show it to a few people and finally approach the one. And I have done this. And so and so, so and so, so and so thing is working. So, uh, is it acceptable? It doesn't happen unless uh, when the translator is fully established. Uh, then people do come and uh, because they want a good translator to come. Then it's up to the translator to say yes or no. In the same continuity, uh, like you translated your own Marathi novel in three years. Myself is a different word. He himself is very proficient. Why he won't translate and why he is assigned to somebody else? Or why he will encourage somebody else who has, as you said, done it in class and then gone back to him? Yeah. Will you not react like that? I know that. And I would have written, if it was necessary to be written in Marathi uh, English, I would have written the drama in English. Why are you for this? Yeah. Or I myself will do it. Yeah. Will that kind of conflict not arise with the translation? Uh, uh, see, if, if the uh, original writer is so sure about his English, then he will do it. Gideon Khan does it. Yeah, he does. He translates all his English. Yeah. In fact, a translation done by someone else, he rejected it. He didn't approve it and he did it himself. Um, uh, Arun Polanka translated or he recreated. Also, so, uh, so it's up to the individual. Completely and also up to the fact of whether they have that kind of command. Now, Mahesh has been a lecturer in English, but he's not a creative writer. That makes the difference. So, Marathi creative writer can't be an English. My experience, I could be wrong. So sometimes uh, authors like Manto have been translated by people of a different uh, nationality who have absolutely no understanding of the local context, and often that translation is more accurate of that environment than local translations. Uh, that's been my personal experience. Is that something that happens? Is that that sometimes local translators sort of take the habitat for granted and miss on certain nuances? Yeah. That's possible. And when you don't know yeah. the original language, you always work with someone who does. That is the way to do it. Like uh, post translation. Uh, uh, someone who gives you a scratch translation. And then you, uh, you sit with that scratch translation and try and uh, work that out into your language. But then you also go back with that translation to the author if he is living and uh, get him to check out the nuances. But exactly what you said, that the person from that culture takes it for granted and uh, sometimes does a disservice to you. Have you, have you in your since have you had, uh, what is the experience like of translating poetry? 
And how is it different from feeling clothes? Ask. Ask. This has been working on our hope for 40 years. <laughs> I've been working on a 17th century Gujarati poet called Akho, mm -hmm. um, translating him into English. And uh, of course, you know, when I say 40 years, it's not like every day of 40 years. <laughs> it's like uh, for months and months, I don't look at it at all because I'm doing other things. And then I look at it again after several months and so on. That's why it's taken long. Um, um, I, I sense, I'm, I'm not done, I've not done any translation. I've only translated one short story from Gujarati into English. That's my only experience of prose translation. And that is a short story by Suresh Doshi uh, called Kurukshetra. But, uh, so, uh, it's not easy for me to compare prose and poetry translation. But I, I suspect, I mean, there, there's a difference. Because the, the very nature of prose and poetry, you know, so so different. And uh, one of the most uh, important differences is uh, uh, concision. Poetry, uh, you know, will uh, always want to say something uh, in five lines, which uh, prose might allow itself to say in two pages. And, 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 and I'm, not, I'm not saying that for that reason poetry is, most, is superior or anything of the kind. This is the nature of the, of the two forms. Is so different. It there are things that there are things that you can say in prose which you can't say in poetry, okay. and and vice versa. The, the difference of the century because Akho is of yeah. 19th century and now you are in 21st, 17th century. Uh, 17th century and then you are in 21st century. So that language also will make up. Uh, uh, Akho's Gujarati is not uh, very archaic. There there are differences with modern Gujarati. But, uh, but there's enough connection. So, you know, if you sit, uh, I mean, I have to sit with Suresh Joshi, who's a Gujarati writer, and go through each of these uh, verses. And uh, I know enough Gujarati to be able to pick up once I've been through the, uh, you know, original kind of uh, uh, little kind of help. Yeah. Um, so I had no difficulty at all, you know. I, I, ne I never felt that this is a very ancient language that I'm. It's, it's modern enough. And his thinking is entirely modern. So, so it's you know. That means a lot. One, one, one small thing of the poetry has a message and it also rhymes a bit more. So, if you convert it to a different language, to translate it to a different language, you still want to retain that meaning, but the new words that come up in the new language may not necessarily rhyme. Will that not be a well, uh, that's interesting because uh, Akho does write with rhyme, and uh, I'm not very good at rhyme. So, uh, uh, what has happened over the years is that uh, I pushed myself because I felt that since the original was rhyme, I would like to have rhyme in my translation. So I pushed myself, and I found that. On some occasions, uh, I manage okay, and when that happens, I'm very happy. But there are other times when, uh, by pushing the rhyme, the translation becomes uh, unwieldy and uninteresting. And I find that, in fact, if I let the rhyme go by and forget about it, uh, I get a better translation. Yes. So uh, my translations are some of them are going to be rhyme, and some of them will be unrhymed. Are you constrained by length? I'm sorry? If the poem is of three stanzas, are you constrained that the translation has to be of three stanzas only? Most often I try to remain as faithful as I can to the original form of the poem. Sometimes, uh, you know, one finds that one has to add a couple of lines in order to get the full sense of the poem. Sometimes my, one might even delete a line. Oh. I've always uh, found, you know, even in school, I found it difficult to believe it when the teacher said the poet means this. How do you know the poet meant that? You know, prose is so much easier in some ways to interpret. I, I so, do you that. actually have the yeah. different, you know, yeah. versions of Akhul's? Uh, yeah, I think that, I think that there is some, so I think that there is some lines of poetry which are fairly clear to any reader, and I think that you know, you and I will uh, most likely agree that these lines mean this. And there will some be some lines which we will always quarrel about. 
So, the, and we'll never have peace between us. <laughs> All right, Mr. Ramajan Roja, you will come back. What was wrong with the first yeah. one? <laughs> This is about, about rhyming, the interesting thing is that Ramanuja has done many translations from Sanskrit and Tan from uh, 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 Tamil. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And, and many of the original poems are rhyme, but he, he, he does not rhyme. He, he, he just, you know. Free words. His poems yeah. are free and, and yet, and yet the, the translations are absolutely brilliant. See, it's a Magnet. question, I think, Sorry? of it's a question of getting the rhythm right. Yeah. More than the rhyme. Yeah. If you can yeah. get the rhythm, yeah. uh, then then your you know, the tone, the tone. That's right. That's right. Tone is very important. To yeah. Country, you know? yeah. A particular man is speaking. And yes, can you that hear that voice? Yeah. You have and it's that man, you know. Yeah. It's nobody else. Yeah. That tone is there. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you for this lovely talk. Uh, I just have